this is Boyan Max, the podcast. Hi, I'm Mark Allen, along with Sean Reynolds, the customer service manager for Boyan Max. Uh, we're going to spend some time with Howard Yaris. Uh, Howard has written a book. We're going to talk about his new book. Let's get a, a little bit of a handle on Howard and who he is. Uh, he's an economist, a professor, an attorney, a businessman, and an activist. Um, lives in Manhattan, and we are very pleased to have you here on our show. And I am pleased to be here. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Sean. Background, I grew up in Brooklyn, and I moved away to go to college and law school, but came back after, and I've been in New York more or less ever since. Um, as you mentioned, I teach at NYU. I'm also an activist. What am I an activist in? I, I'm on my community board. Uh, it's it's very New York City is very interesting. They've created 50 some odd community boards to push more more decision making down to the local level and my community board actually has 220,000 people if it were its own Whoa. city yeah and so there are 50 members on the community board and i'm very involved in trying to make our streets safer and more hospitable to pedestrians other than that as I, you mentioned I, yeah <laughs> i just i have to interrupt and ask do you own a car living in manhattan Yes. Okay. Yes. Because a lot of people who are, I have a friend who uh, lives in Manhattan, doesn't have a car. She takes, you know, Uber or public transportation or whatever. And there's a big controversy in New York because the more welcoming we make streets for pedestrians and for bikers, the more the more difficult a lot of drivers feel uh, mm. the, the streets are for them. So um, I get a lot of pushback from the drivers, um, but I always remind them I'm I'm also aware of the drivers had as well. So it's it's a very interesting dynamic. The bottom line is there's a finite amount of, of space and a lot of people competing for it, just like economics. There's a finite amount of goods and services in the economy and uh, scarce resources. And it's a question of how we should allocate it. Well, let's talk about your book, first of all. It's Praise for understand, uh, understand, Understandable economics yes and I, e e the economy it just it's beyond me i don't get it um well that's because economics is so poorly taught did you ever take a course in economics no i was taking uh uh radio and tv film courses instead <laughs> funny so was i so yes you know there's a there's a lack of education about it so it seems like the timeliness of a book like this is absolutely outstanding Thank you. But here's something fascinating to me. In New York State, high school students have to take trigonometry, but they do not have to take economics. I have a lot of respect for math. In fact, I was a math major undergrad. But come on, trigonometry is, is taught and economics isn't. So economics mm -hmm. is not taught in, in, in high school. And when you get to college, most of the people who take economics courses are just fed a bewildering array, array of jargon and formula and graphs and leave the course not really having a better understanding of the economy than when they went in. So my goal was to write a book that would have none of that jargon, none of those formulas, none of those graph, graphs, and explain the macro economy, the economy, in a, in a uh, way that people can get their head around. It's supposed to read like narrative nonfiction. It, I use analogies. I use um, stories um, and I use examples from the real world to to give people a sense of, of what the economy is about. I just want to say one more thing about it. Physics, you need to know formulas. You need to have access to all sorts of uh, important instruments to, to learn about physics, biology. You need microscopes. You need to know how cells work. What is economics? It's about human relationships and how we divide up all the stuff our economy puts out. It's something that if you look at the world, you should be able to get a sense of how that works. And so the book is helping readers to do that. It's interesting because everybody is talking about the economy. It's down, it's up, recession, no recession. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a, a gentleman on a few months ago who said, the inflation that we have now is not real inflation. It's based on on supply the supply chain, and and once the supply chain catches up, and that's because factories and everybody was 
you know, shut down during COVID and we're trying to catch up. You can't buy a car today uh, without paying a premium on it. I can't wait to tell that one to my wife. Um, <laughs> but How do you think that'll go over? It, 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 it won't go over well. Uh, <laughs> we, need, we, we'll, we need a new car coming up. My point is that, that um, or my question to you, Howard, is, is this true inflation? Is this the inflation that we had in the 80s? Well, let's take one step back. Inflation is an increase in average prices. So yes, it's inflation. There's no way to get around it. That's how it's defined. What causes inflation? There's an amount of money and spending on one hand, and there's an amount of stuff, goods and services on the other. And if the money and spending is increasing faster than the amount of stuff, you get inflation. If the two increase at the same rate, you get stable prices. And if the money and spending incre is increasing slower than the amount of stuff, you get deflation. So it's just the ratio between the two. And yes, the amount of money and spending is increasing faster than the amount of stuff. So you have two, two possible solutions, decrease the spending or increase the stuff. The Federal Reserve cannot manufacture cars. It can't put food on our table. That's all. That's just not within their toolbox. It would be great if they could, but they can't. So how do they try to get inflation under control? They try to, to reduce spending. And how do they do that? They raise interest rates, borrowing gets more expensive, and hopefully people spend less. But, 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 well, okay. Um, so that's gold and silver, mm -hmm. precious metals have been used as a, in quote, hedge against inflation. And we talk mm -hmm. about this on Boy and Max all the time. Um, in your teaching investments at NYU, do you ever mention precious metals? And what's your Absolutely. opinion about that? Well, there are, there are only so many things people could do with the money they save. They could buy stocks, they could buy bonds, or they could buy assets. What are assets? Precious metals are, are way up there. Real estate is way up there. <laughs> And until recently, cryptocurrencies seem to be up there, but have come down quite a bit lately. Um, so people put money into assets and gold and silver and real estate are, are probably the, the most traditional assets. There are some less traditional assets, again, like cryptocurrencies. But that's that's something that um, most assets they're not making more of. Uh, I, there's a, I know that the amount of gold increases very slightly every year, but it's, it's essentially a fixed asset. And it's it's been historically throughout millennia a um, a hedge against inflation and the devaluation of what was uh, what's what was viewed as money. Can you give us your definition of a hedge against inflation? Sure. Um, the as inflation increases, the the U.S. dollar buys less and less. There are certain assets that tend to keep up with inflation. Real estate is always cited as an asset that keeps up with inflation. If inflation goes up 10%, real estate typically goes, goes up by at least that amount. Uh, gold and silver also fit into that category as assets that uh, at least keep up, at, appreciate at least as much as, as inflation. Uh, in other words, and another way to look at it is if gold and silver increase by X percent a year, uh, they would increase by more than X percent. And how much more? Uh, in an inflationary environment by the amount of inflation. Uh, let's take a time out just for a, a, a moment or so and ask Sean, as people are calling you and you're talking to customers of Bullion Max, are they calling about uh, investing in gold and silver and other precious metals to hedge against inflation? I would say I've probably heard that phrase hedge against inflation more than just about anything else since we opened Bullion Max. I would say the majority of our customers, that's exactly what their goal is. And many of them are new to purchasing precious metals. So they're, uh, they're recognizing that inflation is real. They are looking for something other than stocks to make their investments because they, they don't know how to pick the winners and they are certainly afraid of the losers. And they don't want to pick a loser now, even though you know there's already been a significant decrease in the market, you can still pick the wrong horse. 
you can pick the right horse too, but if they don't have that kind of background, the the better choice would be precious metals, given how they uh, they tend to appreciate over time. Time is your best friend with precious metals. You know, the longer you hold it, the better your situation. And so, yeah, people most definitely are hedging against inflation when they when they call bullion max, and it's just protecting those few dollars that they have. You know, I spoke with someone this morning and she was like, oh, it's about thirty five hundred dollars, but it's it's all my extra money. And I love that approach. She's not blowing up her other stuff. She's taking this the otherwise stray or uninvested dollars and putting them in metals. And I think that's a real and wise choice for her. Howard, uh, our guest is Howard Yaris and his book, which is up between us as we're, we're talking. And you can find out more about Howard and his book at uh, howardyaris.com uh also at amazon i'm assuming. absolutely there's, Ab a, there's a lot of information about it on on amazon which is where the vast majority of books are sold these days actually <laughs> oh that online bookstore amazon i remember yeah that. you've heard of it we've yeah. heard of it <laughs> right um are we in an economic crisis or is it something that's going to blow over i don't think so and the reason I don't think so is that the downturn, to the extent there's a downturn in the economy, it's been engineered by the Fed. This is intentional. These are just not bad economic winds that just are blowing over our, our nation. The Fed has raised interest rates to slow the economy. Uh, and so at some point, as the economy slows, as inflation abates, they will take their foot off the brake. And presumably, we, we will revert to a more normal economy. So no, I don't think we're in any kind of crisis. The economy right now is doing fine. Uh, and in fact, the Fed hopes it, it didn't do quite as fine. This is an intentional slowdown to abate inflation. I went to uh, the mall the other day, and I couldn't believe the parking lot. And then going inside the mall, and of course, I forgot my mask, but that's a whole other show. A whole different other, story. Yeah, a different story. But people were were walking out with bags of stuff, clothing, uh, Apple products, um, uh, just all kinds of things from one mall. That it took me ten minutes to find a parking place. Mm -hmm. The the economy is unequivocally robust, and as I said, it's it's kind of counterintuitive to most people. Yeah. It's too good. The Fed wishes it were not as good, and it's taking steps to make it not as good. I think a lot of people don't understand that our central bank, the Federal Reserve, is, is actively taking steps to make our economy worse. That's what they're doing. Why? I don't get it. It doesn't, because it doesn't compute. <laughs> the... The stability of the money is very important. Uh, we all know the story of the Weimar Republic right before the Nazis took over. People had to use wheelbarrows mm -hmm. full of Deutschmarks to buy bread. And anytime inflation gets out of control, I'm not talking about 2% inflation, 10% inflation. I'm talking about constantly accelerating inflation. Nations fall. And death, it's just from the history, death, death follows. So the point is... the. Most central banks, most certainly the Fed, want to want to be stay far away from the possibility of hyperinflation. They want to keep inflation very modest. In fact, they have a target for inflation. It's 2% a year. Their goal is to keep inflation at a stable 2% a year. And it's hit around 10%, and they're really trying to rein it in. The idea is that we'll, we'll endure some temporary economic pain to get inflation back uh, under 2%. That's that's basically what they're thinking. When you but look at the economy and, and how it performs, it seems to be, it's always the president of the United States who is the face of the economy. How fair is that, really? It's partially fair, partially unfair. It, the devil's always in the details. When okay. it comes to oil, it's totally unfair. He doesn't pump oil. He, he doesn't control any oil wells. It's, it's not his doing. There's an international market for oil, and it goes up, it goes down. He he doesn't control it. If, if he controlled it, why would Europe have even higher inflation 
than the United States. So mm -hmm. clearly not that's not the issue. We, we talked briefly about um, what's causing inflation now, this bout of inflation. When I was a kid, we had some inflation and it was caused by OPEC. Uh, I, I don't know if you remember that. They, they cut do. the supply of oil. Um, oil became much more expensive and, and virtually every business uses oil. Even writers use, use oil to power their offices. So it became more expensive to produce things. Prices went up. What's happening now? There's a war in Ukraine. There's the coronavirus that's in, in, impacting supply chains. Mm -hmm. It's just more difficult to produce things. Hopefully, those those underlying problems will will eventually be solved. But in the interim, what the Fed is doing is they're trying to cut down on the spending so as to get that ratio between spending and stuff, between what people are spending and what the economy is turning out in terms of goods and services, gets more in alignment. Yeah, it seems like it would be counterintuitive to say. All right, Americans, stop buying stuff. Of course, American industry would say, no, 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 never say that. Don't yeah. say that. I right. need people to keep buying because I've got employees, I've got a business to run, all of that. But you know, we we try to create that disincentive by making money more expensive. For yes, for and the the irony is that yeah. it's very it's very hard to engineer what they call a soft landing to get spending to decline just the right amount so that yeah. you don't throw the economy in, into a recession. But if the supply chain came back, if we could get our goods and services like we did prior to COVID, would everything come back to normal? That would take a lot of pressure off inflation. That would absolutely, it absolutely would. Because again, it's the ratio between the, the spending and the stuff. So to the extent you can increase the stuff, it, you don't have to reduce the spending as much. Uh, I love the simplicity of that explanation. I mean, seriously, yeah. I don't think I've ever had it really broken down to that level that I think truly anyone would understand that and, and stop arguing about other things that cause inflation. It's it's the ratio of the money to the stuff. Wow. And you mentioned OPEC. And I remember, you know, the, uh, you know, the AB lines, you, you know, if you're your uh, your license plate ended in in a an odd number or an even number and you could only buy a certain amount it was it was crazy and we're not mm -hmm. there but you know here in California not too long ago gas was six and a half dollars a gallon I read about that absolutely right um and I, I, we were in uh, I was in uh, Washington DC and gas there or yeah, gas there was three twenty five, mm -hmm. um, and I didn't. I don't get it. I didn't get it. <laughs> if if prices of gas came down, wouldn't that really help the economy and the inflation ratio? Well, the point is that gas is oil is sold on international markets, and to the extent there's a big difference in prices between different states, it, it has a lot to do with the gas tax. Uh, some Northeast states have eliminated or reduced their gas tax to give drivers a break. Um, mm -hmm. There's a question as to whether that's the best use of public funds and whether if if you're trying to reduce inflation, that's the best thing to do. But uh, drivers love it. So, oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and you can't blame them. No, you can't blame them. Um, and then let's talk about real estate. Uh, I know that real estate, a, a, a friend of mine who runs a, a mortgage company, his business is down 75% in a month. I think that has to be temporary. And it, why, why is it down so much? The obvious answer, interest rates. Interest mm -hmm. rates on, on mortgages have essentially doubled in the last several months, which makes buying so much more expensive. Again, at some point, the Fed is going to take its foot off the brake. Uh, interest rates will start will start coming back down. I, I think everyone will admit that's that's a, a temporary phenomenon. We're talking months, not years, uh, for that to correct itself. But I know that 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 what five percent, six percent interest on a thirty year mortgage. It's a lot. You're paying a lot more for your house, but in reality, five percent is really not that bad, is it? Well, it's all relative. If for people who are able to get mortgages for three percent, and now they're looking at six and a half percent, that's that's a lot of extra mm -hmm. cash. They can afford a lot less house as a result. 
So to the extent that people are buying homes at the top of their budget, uh, their budget has gone down quite a bit. The, the amount of home they're able to get has, has been reduced. And again, that's unequivocal. You know, the cost of buying has gone up. If you're fortunate and have a lot of money, it's not a big deal. But most home buyers are, are stressing themselves to buy a home. And so what they can buy right now has gone down. That, as I said, is due to what the Fed has done. And at some point, again, we're talking months, not years, they're going to take their foot off the brake and interest rates will revert to something closer to what they were uh, before the pandemic. And we're, be, be, we, we still have a lot of time left, but I just wanted to uh, invite you back in a couple <clears throat> months. So oh, we'll can... see how it all turns out. Yes, sir. <laughs> um Let's take a look at at crypto and versus uh, precious metals. I mean, uh, precious uh, uh, crypto this week, the last couple of weeks. I mean, they had a crash. Um, uh, we saw one of the, uh, the the guys who was in a crypto business. I mean, he he's living in a you know a, a bachelor pad, and he was worth something like forty billion dollars. Um, and uh, his well, he claims he has a hundred. His 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 net worth has gone from it was thirty some odd billion to one hundred thousand now. That's his claim. Wow. I mean, tying into the the theme of the book, understandable economics. I'm going to wear the lawyer's hat now. What his business, the basic business was, was holding, storing cryptocurrencies for their customers. So when customers wanted their cryptocurrency back, he told them it was no longer there. You don't need a lawyer. You can ask any middle school student. That's, that's wrong and it's a crime. You don't need any kind of sophisticated understanding of either the law or cryptocurrencies to know that when people entrust their, 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 their cryptocurrency to someone and then they take it and do whatever they did with it and they no longer have it, a crime has been committed. It's it's that simple. As an investment vehicle, mm -hmm. uh, is crypto still a good buy or don't do it's, that? This is a great question because you're in, in precious metals. Precious metals have stood the test of time. That's the ultimate understatement. They were around in biblical times. There were no mm -hmm. cryptocurrencies back then. There was there was almost there was not very much of value back then, uh, other than um, precious metals, and they have literally stood the test of time, millennia. What 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 are cryptocurrencies? They're just something someone made up. They can disappear. They can suddenly the, the amount of gold isn't going to double tomorrow because someone hit a button on a computer. That could happen mm -hmm. to cryptocurrencies. Uh, they say it can't. But who are you going to call or sue or mm -hmm. grab by the shoulders if, if it does happen? They don't even know. It's not even clear who came up with Bitcoin. So again, there's this ex expectation that they can't suddenly flood the market with new Bitcoin. But what happens if that ex expectation turns out to be wrong? What happens if it's as wrong as, as putting your, your thinking, putting your money with Sam Bankman free to sake? It's... It's just some it's people's opinion. It's uh, it's interesting. You said, who are you going to call? I think there should be a, a, a film, Crypto Busters. And uh, it'll take place in Manhattan. And um, uh, we can start at the New York Public Library and the Lions will come out and... Peter Venkman will return again. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, would you, or do you, in your investment courses at NYU, you tell people, hey, have have precious metals as part of your portfolio. Oh, I think it's 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 a great, the best portfolios are the di most diversified portfolios. And it's a great way to diversify your portfolio. As I said a moment ago, there are three major investments, uh, stocks, bonds, and assets. And Precious metals and real estate are, are clearly the two most important assets uh, that people can invest in. And this week, the stock market again went. Did, did the price of gold go up uh, this week, uh, Sean, as we're recording? 
sure did. Just just went over eighteen hundred dollars today, so it's it's making a nice comeback. Silver is up about three dollars and fifty cents over the last two weeks. So really, they're they're on a tear upwards. I'll give you some numbers. Right okay. before I wrote the book, there were three trillion dollars worth of cryptocurrencies out there. Three trillion. Right now, there's about eight hundred billion. It's roughly a two-thirds drop in value. Wow. Oh, my. I, I don't think that's ever happened to gold. No. Oh, my. I, yep. And I, I'm, my understanding that cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, it, it was a way, way, excuse me, it was a way of um, avoiding taxation. So that if you were paid in crypto dollars, you didn't have to pay tax. The IRS quickly caught up with that, and it is taxable now, as I understand it. But um, uh, and, and I understand precious metals. I still can't get my wrap my head around cryptocurrencies. It's it's like a, a fantasy game, like playing a, an internet game to me. Well, it's just a string of code that that they claim can't be replicated. And I don't know if that's true. Got it. Um, Howard, what's next for you? Well, I teach and I am always on the lookout for the ideas for another book. But right now I'm, I'm working on promoting my book. I'm glad to say that uh, in two months, the entire print run sold out. So hopefully the publisher will get around to um, cranking up the presses and getting getting more uh, more supply by by the holidays, which they said they would. So that's pretty much it for me at this point. And uh, I did invite you back. Uh, will you uh, Great. come back? I'd love to. Good. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, oh, congratulations on the run on your book. That's fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, any last minute thoughts uh, on, uh, on, on gold and silver right now, is, uh, 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 Sean? Well, I, I think... It goes up and down. You know, it's only ever going to go so far down. We don't know how far up it can go. Hold it as long as you can hold it is is really the best thing for you. Time is your friend with precious metals. I you know, I'll say something in closing on precious metals. Someone asked me, "Is aren't precious metals and assets like real estate gambling? And I said, they're like gambling in the short run and that it goes up and down. But in the long run, they're the exact opposite. You gamble long enough, you lose. You hold precious metals or assets long enough, you win. So in the long run, they're the exact opposite. That is great news. Uh, great uh, information <laughs> for us uh, here at Bullion Max. Um, thank you very much, Howard. Again, thank you. If you uh, want information on Howard, and I'm assuming you blog and write all the time up on your website at Howard. If, yeah, Howard Yars. Dot com. And, Absolutely. And we have it. Uh, we've had it up on our uh, screen throughout our interview, as well as a picture of uh, of Howard's uh, book cover, Understandable Economics. Uh, I'm Mark Allen for Sean Reynolds. Thank you very much for watching. We will see you next time. Sean, do you have anything to add right now? Don't forget to subscribe to yes, this sir. podcast. Because I always do. Uh, <laughs> I always forget to say that. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. We'll see you on our next episode. Bye-bye for thank now. Thank you.